Good afternoon and welcome to this Got Safety presentation. I am your co-host Rick Roman, Michael Crowley, and I'm sitting alongside with Michael Crowley. Um, while we wait for more people to get joined in here real quick, just some quick housekeeping things. Just want to let you know there will be a replay available. You'll get an email tomorrow with a link to a replay. Uh, we're going to have some handouts for you uh, today as well. Um, we are also, which is going to include uh, the slides that we'll be presenting, so you'll have those to refer to. We also uh, will be do answering your questions at the end. So if you have any questions as we move along here, feel free to type them in, and when we get to the end of the presentation, we will answer your questions. Love to. Uh, before we get started real quick, Michael, why don't you tell the folks here a little bit about who Got Safety is yeah, and yeah. what we do. So uh, we've been around since 1990. Uh, we had another name back in those days called EEAP, the safety people. And over the last 10 years or so, we've transitioned to gotsafety.com as we've kind of uh, had some different names. And frankly, EEAP was a tough name. God bless it. It really meant nothing. It was just EEAP. In fact, it was Employee Employer Assistance Program was the name. But to get that embroidered down your shirt, you had to wear long sleeves because it was so long to get down there. So we shortened up with Got Safety. So we are a OSHA compliance and defense company. We help companies write their documentation. We do a lot of safety training material, safety videos, safety content. We've got an app that you sign off with. So really the whole idea is we are the country's finest, greatest, and may I say, best-looking safety guys in the business. We are based in southern Utah, originally out of the Los Angeles area where Rick and I were raised. Rick, you're raised in Glendale, right? Yes, sir. Glendale, well, California. You gotta love Glendale, California. I was raised in the San Fernando Valley, and uh, we moved to Utah a few years ago to be able to expand our things across the country and get some things done. And so we're just proud to be here with you today. We appreciate you coming on board and getting to know us, and we really appreciate it. Yep, and we also, uh, for you folks that are attending here today, uh, you guys were sent a very special offer. You're going to want to make sure that you contact us after, yes. after this presentation to take advantage of that. We'll probably be sending an email or something of sorts as well, yeah. just to make sure you have all our information. But I think this will be very handy. Let me share my screen okay. here so that we can go ahead and get this started. He loves to share screens with us. Oh, and it's beautiful. There we go. So... Today, what we're going to be talking about is some new uh, Oregon OSHA regulations that are that are going into effect real soon here, Michael. Yeah. And uh, and and you guys, as, as business uh, owners and and managers and what have you, are really going to need to get a grip on this stuff to make sure that you're staying in compliance, keep your employees safe, and avoid getting cited. Yeah, and then hopefully today, once we get done with this, we may be able to uh, present this in a way that you may find it interesting and really get your questions answered. So even after the webinar today, please give us a call. We'd love to answer all your questions, even if we can't get to them today. We're going to do our dang to know. We know we have billions of people wanting to attend and uh, just trying to get this done. Yep. So we're really, this is a, a two-part presentation because you guys got two regulations that are going into effect coming up real quick. In fact, next week, there's a new heat illness regulation going into effect. June the 15th, I believe that is Wednesday. Ooh, Next Wednesday. Wednesday, this goes into effect. Uh, you'll see at the bottom here, I put the link to where you can view the entire code if yeah. you're so inclined, but we are gonna be talking about that. That particular regulation requires that your company uh, have a program. We also will be talking about the fire protection yes. uh, from uh, wildfire smoke. That one goes into effect July 1st. And again, you can view that entire regulation at the bottom. Now, this one, Michael, does not require a program. Yeah. Uh, tell, well, tell us a little bit about what, what the difference where you need or don't need a program. Good point, Rick. So the logic to this is when you see a lot of OSHA regulations, they talk about you need to do training, you need to have programs, and some people just make a program for everything. And that really is the insufficient way, and, and, and it is not a good way to write your document, your OSHA safety manuals. So in this case, this one does not need a program. Correct. So what we've done is we've created a, a training system for it so that we can have that available to you and make sure, and it comes with that special offer that we gave you before registering prior to this webinar had taken place. But that is the logic. There are some things that require a program and some things that just require training. And so I'll, I'll give you an example. There's no such thing as a ladder safety program. 
but there is ladder safety training. Mm -hmm. So there's tons of ladder safety training that you need to do, what kind of ladder to use, if you're gonna work off the ladder, if you're climbing off the ladder, but there really is no program that has to be written. And in this case, for the fire protection, wildlife, uh, wildfire smoke, no, no program. program at all. So that's it. Yep. But this one here, the heat illness prevention that we talked about initially, yeah. uh, that one does require a program. It does, it does require. So let's get into what the requirements of this program are going to be for it's you beautiful. here. So first, this uh, standard applies both indoor yeah. and outdoors where the heat index equals or exceeds 80 degrees Fahrenheit. That's fair. Uh, requirements rec uh, include providing access to shade, okay. drinking water, high heat practices for when it's over 90 degrees, an emergency medical plan, an acclimatization plan, uh, heat illness prevention plan, that's the written program okay. that we talked about, supervisor and employee training, and documenting that training. As we know, Michael, if you don't document it, you didn't do it. You didn't do it. And let me tell you, everything so far sounds incredibly reasonable, right? Let me just tell you, California's got one that really is a doozy. But so far, I in this webinar, I'm not bothered with what we got going on here. So there are some exemptions. Uh, if you have a work environment where the employee is not required to perform work for more than 15 minutes uh, in a 60 minute period, maybe if they're just going it maybe in and out of the warehouse occasionally and you've got an air conditioned okay. office, okay. then the program's not gonna apply to you. Um, this one was a little bit interesting, Michael. It says where exposures are generated from the work process, such as occurs in a bakery. Why don't you give us your thoughts a little uh, bit on that? Now this one is a tough one that I'm telling you to really know for sure. Since we do so much OSHA defense for our clients, the reality of it is this one is, as we look at it, is a tough one. Now, if they were to give us two or three different examples on this, we could have had a better idea. But what they're talking about is an artificial heat source, not the sun or just the outside temperature, but an artificial interior heat source that creates it like in a bakery what I would have really liked to hear is like bakery or foundry or something like that because once we got into the foundry or some sort of inner part uh, even like a large laundry play laundry department where they have these, yes. these drying machines that create a higher heat that would have been a better one for me but I am saying that I'm assuming that it's like that, that all those don't really fall in line with that. I believe that's what it is, but we're gonna have to see some citations yes. come out and how they implement this process. Right. Because if they do say, well, a foundry should have it, it's not a bakery like the example we gave, and that's where it gets and dicey for me. Yeah, along and it's right. hard to imagine that yeah. a place that gets that hot, it wouldn't have something in place. So uh, you go into these places in a foundry and it could be 95 degrees and 98 degrees. And when we see the charge here in a few bit, you, you, you'll have to qualify all those. So right now the system is saying that it doesn't, but that really is a belief if I take the example they've given me yes. and apply it to some other industries. Like I said, I would have preferred to have a couple different industries, two or three different examples on that, but you can't hit Oregon OSHA too bad for that. They, they gave us an example, right. we're gonna roll with it. Let's we'll see how this see turns how out. Apply That's what's great about us. Once we yep. see the defense, once we see the tition, citations, we can tighten up our ship and know exactly what we need to be doing. Exactly. So then the next one is for emergency operations yeah. uh, directly involved in protection of life or property or the restoration of essential services such as evacuation, rescue, medical structure, firefighting, law enforcement, utilities, communication. Those people are exempt from this program. Um, and then, of course, if you work in a building where it, the mechanical ventilation keeps it below 80 degrees. So if you're in always below 80 degree temperatures, is it going to matter? You're exempt. So now, if you're a fireman, you're exempt. Well, yeah, if you're a fireman, you're you're, you're going to have to put out the fire no matter how hot it is. Right. So if it's too hot in a fire system, you can't claim, hey, I need a break. I know the <laughs> building's burning down, but I'm going to need to take that break. I get it. All right. Right. Fireman, God bless you. We love you. Yep. All right. And then you've got some partially exempts oh, uh, partially. for for employees who prefer, perform rest or light workloads, which we're going to define here in table one momentarily. Um they're exempt from some of the requirements in sections three through 10, which are really the bullet points that I just read on the previous slide, that they'll have some partial exemptions to those things. And then of course, associated uh, support activities okay. for wildland firefighters, such as camp services, would be exempt from section seven, which is the acclimatization. As you can imagine, Michael, it's hard to, if, if you need to acclimatize yourself and it takes a couple of weeks and there's a fire, 
obviously the people that are it's a problem yes it's a problem you, you, you they don't have time to acclimatize they got to get out there but the ones that we're talking about are partially exempt are the rest or light duty yes what the freak is a rest well we're gonna, resting at the we're going to look at that table here just in just a moment here besides uh, the employees that probably should be let go who else is resting while they're at work <laughs> right when you're this not is insane. right oh this is nice. so uh and then the last one would be people that are working from home they're only required sections okay. nine and ten which are really the training so they have to do the training but you don't have to provide these other things yeah, for you're them working from home what are you going to do you can't do much from home all right so here you go here's the table the that explains the different types of workloads so they can right. be uh, classified as rest light moderate heavy or very heavy um so like you said you've got rest which is sitting and thinking i don't know I mean, they don't even give us a classification job. for rest they don't even give us a uh, light duty and rest are two different things right because uh, of the comma and and the fact that i mean even under light work i see sitting with minimal hand and arm work so even if you're just answering phones and doing a computer right. you're not at rest i couldn't even tell you what rest is even if you said i'm a security guard and i rest all day you still got to walk around and look don't you uh so occasional or slow walking exactly okay, so, so that's not uh resting so what, what are you a, I, a bed tester and you're just sleeping all day I, what could you possibly do as resting i i have no idea let's assume that everybody on this webinar is at the very least like in duty. the light category well, if you're a resting guy i listen if you've got a comment to make about what a resting job i personally would love to hear it because i have said thought what could your job be i rest i'm a personal sleeper i show people how pajamas feel when i sleep all day i mean i don't even know what you would be doing that is insane so let's get to the light duty in the morning right. okay. so the light you can see here they've, they've listed a bunch of those and so you'll need to look so you can yeah. determine yeah. if you would have those partial exemptions if this is the type of work that all of your employees are doing yeah so to finish off the rest of the moderate, heavy, and very heavy, here is a list of different types of work that your employees would be performing, and you're going to need to reference this. And again, we're going to be providing you all of these things. Um, you're going to need to reference this to be able to calculate for some of the other requirements that you have here down uh, further in the presentation. So the first one there, the uh, number three, as they called it, the first one was access to shade. You have to establish and maintain one or more shade areas that are immediately and readily available to expose to, uh, employees that are outdoors when the index equals or exceeds 80 degrees and the areas must meet, must meet the following criteria. Must be open to the outside air, unless you have uh, provide mechanical ventilation. You have to have enough to accommodate the number of employees that are on the recovery or rest period. Has to be located as close as practical where the employees are locating. Any thoughts on that? What would you call, again, kind of vague, Practically close as possible. possible. Close as practical. What is the statement? It says it has to be located as close as practical. That's pretty dang close. Let me just tell you, as as somebody who's done this for over 20 years, I'm just telling you right now, when they say as close as practically possible, this is very close. Do not look at yourself and say, well, I was 50 yards away from it. That's pretty close. If I'd have moved it over, it would have just been, it's not practical because I would have had to move the trailer more and we, it would be wasting time. Yeah, wasting time does not make something not practical. Okay, that is not a factor. Practically possible is like, uh, I couldn't move it that close because there was a pit of fiery live alligators that are eating people alive. And if I get it over all that, that's practically possible. You can't do it. So don't think that, don't try to stretch that if you've got these things they need to be almost right on top of your people because yep. you don't want to roll the dice on this one it's not going to be good and then of course it has to be present during meal periods and then if you're using trees or other vegetation the the shaded area must be sufficient to protect the employees yeah and i'm telling you if you're using these trees they better have leaves on them okay guys <laughs> i mean i don't know what and i, mean, I know oregon's got trees holy yeah. mac you guys got some trees but make sure the sun, as it goes, you just don't disappear. I mean, sometimes you go to Central California or in Nevada or Vegas, and they say they've got trees. <laughs> they don't got trees like you guys got trees. <laughs> so my logic to this is you're pretty good with the tree thing because I know what we're talking about. But make sure it's not going to be really good shade. And the two hours later, it's going to be like six feet smaller because it moved over. So you just got to be sensitive to that. Yep. 
And there are a couple exceptions here. Uh, again, you'll be able to review that, but basically if, if you're not able to, because it's not practical to put up those structures, yeah. you have to have something else like cooling vests so you don't get to get off the hook entirely. Not the hook. All right, next thing is access to water. Now this one, I, in comparison to California, is they've got some elements that I actually like. It says that you gotta ensure that you have a sufficient supply of drinking water immediately and readily available to exposed employees at all times at no cost when the heat index yeah. is at or above 80 degrees. And so they say here, the water has to be either cool or cold. And they give the temperatures cool is 66 to 77, cold is 35 to 65. Yeah, like you said, and the reason why we're comparing it to California is California has had a heat illness program for uh, for a long time. Since 2006? Now. Yeah, since 2006, but I was trying to think about how long it is. So they've had it. But there's, like you said, it says suitably. You actually have temperatures in Oregon. I think that's great because suitably uh, cold is so vague. Yes. We've had some issues with some inspectors who really like ice, or maybe they're from Europe, and they don't <laughs> like ice at all. And tootle cold is like 90. So <laughs> God bless the Europeans and they're no ice. I, I don't understand this, by the way. But I digress. The logic is I love the standard. Yes, right? I think this is a good standard. We've got some we've got some direct Good job, Oregon, on telling yep. us what temperature you want. So that basically water. 35 to 77. That's a pretty good range. That's, that's pretty big range. That's pretty reasonable. So you but you gotta be able to supply that to your employees at no cost yeah. to them. Um, you have to have enough for each of them to consume 32 ounces per hour. Now, depending on how many employees you have, yeah. Michael, that could be a bit of a challenge. Now, it could be, but you don't have to have all the water on the job site all at one time, right? So you don't have to bring a water truck. You just have to have a way to replenish it and a, and a system all day where you can put that into place. So let me just tell you, this is not a big, big deal to do, be able to do. I really think this should be easy, and you're probably doing this already. Any person that's working on a moderate to heavy workload outside and doesn't consider water, this is that, – that is – that is a low bar to fulfill for your people. So I, I'm yes. looking at this going, all right, this is nice. This is a this is a reasonable standard that we can do. And then, of course, you've got to provide them with ample opportunity yes. to uh, consume the water. And it does say that you can uh, use other things such as uh, some uh, Gatorade, Gatorade and okay. stuff like that. But they, that shouldn't completely replace water. And, but, and Rick, and just to make sure we're all clear, the, the, the writing on the slides, the, the clips that we have, are directly from the code. Yes. They're directly from the code. So if you see them on the slide, we're not taking that and trying to reword it or something to make this. We are snipping, snop, and pops in the code to make sure you get what you like. So that just yep. know that. You'll get the slides later, like we said, but just know that's what we're pulling. Yep. So then you have to put into effect some high heat practices. Ooh, high heat. So when engineering controls and administrative controls do not reduce an employee's exposure to a heat index that's less than 90, the following heat practice procedures must be implemented and maintained. Okay. So the first one is communication between supervisors and employees that yeah. it has either by voice, electronic or other effective means. Um, you also have to have methods for identifying heat related Ill illness by yeah. using one or more of the following, uh, the recommended communication with employees uh, regular communication with employees that are working alone, using a buddy system yep. or other effective means of observation and communication. Um, then you also have to designate uh, one or more employees to be authorized to call for emergency services if needed. And you should uh, allow others to, to be able to do that as well, uh, besides a designated person in case if the designated guy is the guy who needs to be called for. Yeah, I, I really agree with you, Rick. These are this is reasonable standards that I'm reading here that are you, you got to be able to have a process in play. Yep. Then you have to have measures for uh, you know uh, measuring the temperature yeah. in structures that don't have mechanical ventilation in them. Mm -hmm. And then so here's where it starts to get a little a little dicey in that you you start getting a lot of options and you're really gonna have to think about what which of these work best for you. Okay. So you have to have a written uh, prevention plan rest break schedule. Oh, and right, you get right, to right. choose. So you need to choose from one of the three following options. It's an employer design schedule. Okay. Uh, a schedule using the information found in the NIOSH. Okay. Or NIOSH. 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 Sorry. NIOSH. All right. NIOSH. And then you've got, uh, then there's a simplified schedule 
designed by Oregon OSHA. And so those are the three options. So let's now before we go on, everything before that, remember the training of, of what signs and heat illness, that special offer we're given, we're gonna take care of you on that. That's part of that special offer that we gave you before the webinar. When it comes to that, all of those trainings so your people will train to fulfill that sheet, that we, we got that taken yep. care of built into the special offer. So make sure that you take advantage of that. So when it comes to these rest breaks, yep. so you've got the the uh Option A, this is your employer designed uh, rest break schedule. Okay. It's uh, you, using the minimum durations in table one, which is listed below, and then that you must integrate elements of subsections one through four, uh, which may increase the duration or intervals of the rest break periods. So that first one being the effect of personal protective equipment, if your folks are using that, the type of, of uh, work, uh, clothing that they may be wearing, the relative humidity, and then the intensity of their work. And then on top of that, they've got the note that you should consider the effect of the exposure to direct sunlight. So these are all, so you've got the table down here. The table looks actually, boy, it looks simple, right? You got 90 yes. degrees or great, basically 90 to 99, it's 10 minutes every two hours. And then if it's 100 or greater, it's 15 minutes every hour. But where it gets tricky, Michael, is integrating those other things that are kind of vaguely. On a defensive standpoint, these other things that they're trying to integrate are going to be an absolute nightmare based on what the inspector thinks when they come out to the site. And this is going to be where it's tricky. So if you're following the the, the, the pattern down below, the 90 every 10 minutes, blah, 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 and then all of a sudden he's got a vest on, one guy may say, Oh, the vest really keeps in the heat. You should have factored that in. It should have been 50. I mean, it's so, uh, you know. It, it's big. And, it's, and, and to me, where it gets dicey is, is, I mean, everything's good, right? It's all fun and games till someone gets poked in the eye. Yeah. And in this case, if you have an employee that winds up in the hospital from heat illness or heaven forbid an employee yes. dies from this, Whatever you calculated clearly wasn't good enough. Of course, that's going to be what it is. Now, we're not trying to make fun of the code just to be jerks. We want to make sure this is good. What we're trying to do here is to show the difficulty in the code, what is reasonable and what is solid, and what is going to be tricky with it. Because right. you, you've got to see the humor in this, because as you're trying to implement this program, and you're like, all right, man, the bottom grid looks pretty easy, but then you got this. The guy is dead or loses something or has heat illness, and then something bad takes place, and you're trying to protect yourself as a company. I mean, the reality of it is, if you had a problem, you did something wrong. And on this chart, it doesn't even talk about diabetes. What if you didn't know the employee had diabetic and he's more susceptible yes. to heat illness than, and, than you thought? And that's where that's this why we're saying you, you really got to look when you're weighing these yeah. options, not, not say, oh, well, this one looks the easiest to do. I agree. Rick. You, you got to just make sure which one actually works best for your company. Because there are some medicines that make you more susceptible to heat yep. illness. And there isn't, as you'll see as we go through, there isn't a one size fits all. You, no. you, you're going to have to look at this and, and see what works best. You got to see what works best for, for you. So now we're on. On to option two. Option two. Do we like option two better or worse, Rick? Like I said, it depends on on what your company does. Good this answer, is, Ricky. This is the NIOSH one here. The NIOSH. NIOSH. What are we saying? NIOSH. Pecan or pecan? Come pecans, on. Pecans. NIOSH. There we go. Anyway, this one here, uh, you got to use the information found in Appendix A, which we're going to look at here momentarily. Okay. Um, note. It's the note here says uses an adjusted ambient temperatures. Okay. You must follow the instructions underneath the table uh, for different work schedules exist for those where different work schedules for those that wear chemical resistant suits. So we're going to look at we're going to look at this table here. So this one here starts off starts off before you even look at the table it starts off with an asterisk. So it says here. So when you're looking at this table. It's going to be with the assumption that the workers are physically fit, well rested, fully hydrated, under the age of 40, have adequate water intake, and that there is 30% relative humidity. Boy. Now listen, that's straight from the code, right, Rickles? That's, this is straight, straight from, from the, the code. code. So to use this table below without having to adjust it some, all of those things have to be taking place. Otherwise, you got to adjust a little bit. Then you'll also see, in addition to that, 
If you look at where it shows the adjusted air temperature, there's a footnote there that we'll be discussing on the next slide. Yep. And then there's a couple of footnotes uh, next to the caution there. So as you can see in this one here, as the temperature goes up every degree or two, it changes based on what type of work, whether you're light, moderate, or heavy, how long of a break you're going to take. And this chart is directly from the code. This is their chart. My gosh, I love this chart. So, as you can see, when it's 90 degrees, it's saying normal. Now, again, we're assuming here normal means, but based off of what the labor code the is. Humidity levels. I mean, what if it's only 5% humidity in Oregon? Is that even possible? Well, I mean, Oregon, you are so green. The thing that yes. you are 5% humidity, I don't even know what that is. I mean, what would that be? I'm sure they're possibly. It's like after a nuclear blast part, or something. What part of where you're at. But, but, but the thing is, is where it says normal here, it's saying that you could use your normal. You don't have to alter your breaks. You give a normal break. And from looking at the labor code there, it's basically that would be like 10 minutes every two hours. However, again, that's that's assumed what they're saying here until we see how they implement it, if it's any different. But but I think it's pretty safe to assume that that would mean your normal break period. But once now, when we start getting to 100 degrees now, if you're doing moderate or heavy, heavy work, well, now you got to be doing uh, work 45 minutes and take a 15 minute break. And if it's heavy, you're working 30 minutes and breaking for 30. Okay, I, I, I know we all have different thoughts on this. This is where it gets nutty for me in this. This, this is where I think that the state is going to have a difficult time. You're really saying that at some point the employee should only be allowed to work for 30 minutes and he has to rest for 30 minutes. And you can see in the chart, it gets worse. There are points at 105. Chart. Listen, let's yes. play that this wasn't in Arizona. You'd never go to work ever again. I mean, I'm telling you, nothing would ever be built ever again. I understand it's Oregon. Oregon. People aren't, aren't used to this kind of temperature. And I, I don't know how, didn't we look, Rick, to see how often it gets to 100 degrees or 101? It well, it, it depends. Doesn't happen often. It doesn't happen too often. And, and obviously, yeah, there's probably news. some areas in Oregon where northern where you're never going to see that, right? You'd probably be looking at, at 100-year highs to get to that. Uh, but other areas in southern Oregon, especially as you start getting inland away from the coast, you might see some of these. Yeah, Maybe not sure. 105. At 105, you'd have to work 15 minutes and rest or 45. I think we just call the employees off that day. I don't think it's it, – it, yeah, and you got to pay them for the 45 minutes of rest, right? If you're working, no, they're on – yes, paying you're, they're, you're paying 45 them. 45 minutes to work 15, that's insane. No business owner would do that. That's craziness. Just don't work. So here's what we're talking. Look at the chart. But if your humidity is high, that also puts in a well, factor of dealing with that. Right, Ricky? Yep, that's the next part here. Oh, so man. here's here's the footnotes on the first one where to the adjusted temperature. So it says, so now you got to take in consideration first, before you go to that chart, we already talked about, we got to make sure these guys are fit under yep. 40 and all of those things. And now we got to look, is it cloudy out? Is it partly cloudy? Do we have full sun? If you have full sun, you're going to add 13 degrees. So when it's 88 degrees and you're now, you got to add 13. Now you got to look at that, at the, at that, that uh, chart. chart as if it's 101 out. Right. Uh, so let's suggest, Rick, it never gets to be 101. It never gets to be 101. With your chart, it's very reasonable that chart-wise, it would be at 100. It could be with the, because yes, when you factor in now, again, it's, yeah. It, I, I know my, my son lived in Portland for a while, and when I went up there in the summertime, it was mostly overcast even in the summertime. Time. And so maybe you're only adding seven seven degrees. Uh, but still, you, you, you could be at uh, 88 degrees. You're adding seven. Now you're at 95. You've fallen into the chart where you got to start doing this. So now, after you've factored in whether it's cloudy or sunny, now I got to look at the humidity. Okay. Right? So, well, if it's only 10 air feet. temperature, cloudy or sunny, right. and now humidity. And physical fitness. Oh, and physical fitness. So, this is the fourth physical fitness. So, now we're going to look at the relative humidity. Okay. And as I mentioned, you probably don't get to 10% too often. If you did, you'd get to subtract eight degrees. No. Uh, but 10% you... humidity? That's got to be like a record for. Uh... <laughs> At 30%, no adjustment, but if it gets, now these are numbers that you're probably more realistically looking at, 40, 50, and 60%. You got to add three, six, and 9%. My gosh, by the time you figure this out. It's 200 you, degrees outside. Well, not only that, but I mean, <laughs> what the heck are we doing? you're going to have to be a meteorologist, a mathematician, and a doctor. You will have to. <laughs> 
you're going to have to be a this is what I know we're not trying to make light of this, but I'm trying to deliver this in a way that is not like boring your stuff. But I'm just telling you this. This is crazy. So if you're like, well, it's only about 80 degrees, but the humidity is 75, uh, you know. Right. Now you're adding nine. So we're at 89 and it's partly cloudy. We just added seven. So now you're at 96. You're right into the thing where you're doing, working for a half hour and resting a half. <laughs> right. You're you're working 40 minutes and resting for 20 minutes. I mean, this is an unproductive day. I mean, it really is. I mean, I don't know. What are we talking in Oregon? What are you well, guys weak out there? You, so, you got to man up over there and get ready for the heat, people. So now we get here the as it, on the caution. It, it did have the second footnote, and I guess you would you've already suggested this that it's uh, high levels of heat stretch. You should consider rescheduling your activities. Now listen, we love you people <laughs> in Oregon. Listen, we've been out there. He's got a son that's lived there, and I love the fact that you just don't have to pump your own gas. God bless the fact that you don't have to get the old values out there. I just love the death. But my point is this, we're here to help you, the training and everything. And this chart that we've got here, straight out of the code. We're not making this up. This is exactly what the code is. And these slides will help you as you go back to remember what these are. Yes. These are all the important information for you to get done what you need to get done with this. And let me tell you, as I looked at some of these formulas before, I could totally think of some as tough as this one was. Oh my. That there were there's some industries that this would be the better option for you to choose to be able to, you know, to to not be resting all day and, and working minimally. <laughs> I got to go to white work, honey. Can I bring a pillow so I can rest a lot? Because it's going to be a resting day. I, I can't even imagine. All right. Let's... So now we got, we got another chart, don't we, Rick? All right. Yes. So wait a minute here. Oh, that's what backwards. happened? Here we go. Oh, you got us twisted. Oh, wait a minute. We're still on the same one. So, so remember we talked about if, uh, for your folks that are yeah. wearing chemical resistant suits. So if you've got folks that are wearing chemical resistant suits, then you're going to go by this chart here. Yeah. And again, it's showing you, you, you know, whether it's partly cloudy, fully cloudy, um, and you've got your, your normal breaks. Uh, the, and you can see a couple of them have footnotes and they're, they're denoted uh, down Rick, below. On this one, tell me the first note is the rest period. When you get to 90 degrees, you, you you rest for 15 and work 45. Uh, it's no, so oh, we went. So okay, Rick's, so if you'll look here where it says 35, 25, it would be work 35. So the first number is how long you work. The second number is how long you break. Holy mackerel! You work for 10 minutes at 80 degrees and uh, rest for 50. Well, well, I got to change my job. That sounds fantastic. <laughs> I think I want to be a, a high heat worker. Do they have workers in Oregon that just work in high heat? This sounds like a great job to be a high <laughs> heat worker. So anyway, so there's that chart for you. You'll be able, and, and again, this is assuming that they're physically fit under 40 and all of that jazz. They exactly look like me and Rick. Good looking, <laughs> physically fit, no dad bods. You know what I'm talking about. All right. Now here's option three. And at a glance, this one also looks... Uh, much more simple to navigate than than option two for sure. Uh, however, this one may or may not be the best fit for you. In in this case here, um, you are doing if it's ninety or greater, it's a ten minute break every two okay. hours. At ninety five, it's twenty minutes. A okay. hundred or greater, it's thirty minutes every hour. A hundred and five or more, it's forty minutes every hour. And you don't have to do any calculations. You don't have to figure out what whether they're doing light work, heavy work. Or what? But this is one of those where, like, I, if the majority of your people are doing light work, the other schedule doesn't have them taking a forty-minute break every hour. So the other schedule may be better for you. I know With, that. Rick, let me stop you. I know this question is going to come up. What if half of your guys are doing one thing and the other half are doing another? Can you have two different schedules? Again, until I, we I see how this implements. I'm going to no, say I don't think you're going to be able to do this. You don't. You're going to have, and that's why you're going to have to. You have to pick one of the three. This is going to be a company heat illness program policy. That yes. We're going. So depending on how many guys do light work versus the heavy work, that's where. And I'm, I'm just that's why I said questions. you were going to need to be a mathematician. Uh, I, yes. Listen, and and what can you have one one day and one the next? You pick a policy. It's going to be in your. It's going to be in your written. Program. I know. I just asked the question. I already know the answer, but I'm asking. So what you pick is what you. As pick. a company, we have picked option C, and that's what you're living and dying by. My gosh, this is uh, this is going to be fun, guys. Get ready. Put on your big boy pants, because let me tell you, this is going to be the a lot of fun. The good news is, is God safety's here. We are here to help you with this with every bit of this stuff. Um, 
What have we gotten ourselves into? So now the, the next point, now we're off of the rest breaks. Now we're talking about acclimatization. Okay. So uh, you have to develop and implement an acclimatization plan and procedures in writing, which will be in your written plan, of course. Uh, employees must choose between two options. A or B is described below and implement the chosen plan. Option A, uh, employees develop their own acclimatization plan, must integrate the, and implement the following factors for acclimated and unacclimated workers. The effect of clothing and personal protective equipment, personal uh, and uh, environmental risk factors, such as you mentioned before, medications okay. right. that or any uh, sicknesses that employee may have, uh, and re-acclimatizing employees, either due to weather changes or folks that have been away from work for more than seven days. And then lastly, uh, use maintenance of auxiliary cooling systems. So that would be your first option. And then option B, the NIOSH. NIOSH, Rick, it's NIOSH. NIOSH. Acclimatization plan. Uh, so in there, so they've got one that you could use, must follow their plan developed by the Centers of Disease Control. Uh, and so again, it says here, based on weather patterns, OSHA recognizes there's no one size fits all. So they allow you to yeah. choose from one of these two plans here. Again, we'll help you, we can help you determine which one's gonna work best for your company and get that implemented into your program. Boy, this is gonna be fun, my gosh. Then of course, you gotta have the emergency medical part of it, which is basically uh, you're addressing employee explo exposure to uh, extensive heat in accordance with the Oregon regulation listed here below. Uh, when employees are performing construction activities, they must also comply with another regulation and then uh, for those that fall under Division 7 forest activities, they also got to comply with this other regulation down here. So there's, so there may be a combination of regulations that kind of overlap each other yes. that you're also having to comply with. But so that you got to work that into the medical plan. Yeah, I love it. Now the heat illness plan, like we mentioned, we've got a great offer to help you guys with this. But if you were to choose to try to venture and do this on your own, these are the elements of what you need to have in that plan. Because we want to tell you what they are. Our, our hope is to give you the information that you can choose to do whatever you like. Yes. When you leave here, you have all the slides to show you all the bullet points, everything you need so we can take the, the madness and get it simple. Exactly. So you got to develop and implement, maintain an effective heat illness prevention yes. plan in writing must be made available to the workers and to uh, at the work site to the employees and Oregon OSHA upon request. And yep. it must contain at least the following information, how employees will be trained on the hazards of heat exposure, uh, how, how to recognize symptoms of yep. uh, dehydration and respond to suspected heat illness, uh, how to have sufficient amounts of cool potable water, how employees will be provided frequent opportunities and encouragement to stay hydrated, how employees will uh, be provided space to rest in a shaded area, how the employer will implement the heat illness prevention rest break schedule, and how the employer will implement the acclimatization procedures for new employees and employees returning to work in absence of seven or more days. Now, these questions that he's put down are written just like it is in the code. And they ask the question, how are you going to do this? How are you going to do this? If you're going to write your own one instead of going through our, session, our special program, you, you really got to make sure you're answering these in a way yes. that articulate it simple and concise. This is, this is a tricky system. So please take our offer because if not, you're running the dice. You, you, you haven't done this for as long as we have. I don't care how old you are. You, you haven't done straight safety for as long as we have, I can promise you. All right. So when it comes to uh, the training for the employees, yeah. uh, you got to provide training for them on all of the environmental uh, and personal risk factors. Uh, you got to train them on the procedures for complying with yeah. the requirements of the standard, including but not limited to the employer's responsibility to provide the water and the heat index information, shade, rest breaks, first aid, as well as how employees can exercise their rights under the standard without fear of retaliation. 
Uh, they have to be trained on the importance of frequent consumption of small quantities of water, the concept and importance of methods of acclimatization, different types of heat illness, uh, the importance to immediately report uh, whether it's signs in themselves or if they see it in others, that they have to report that. And then, uh, and then non-occupational factors such as drugs and alcohol that they may be doing it off the work site that could affect their, you know, how thing, how their body's going to react to the heat when they're at work. And we're talking about not necessarily illegal. We're talking prescription drugs. Yes, that, that could be. And and one of the questions that and are you done reading all those? I books? am. Those are all the types of the trainings that you got to train your folks. If you take part of the special offer that we're going to be that, that we want you to call us about. All these trainings are going to be included in that. Uh, and th yeah. That's the brilliancy of this. And we, we really thought about this as we went over this and said, man, we need to make sure we give Oregon the greatest opportunity for success in this. And let's figure out if we can do this for these people. Th this time is so tough. Coming on the backside of COVID, we've all had losses. Don't get me emotional here. We've all had losses. We've either lost family, friends, money, and, and whatever it is, business, uh, our businesses that we have put our blood, sweat, and tears into, and then they've crumbled over this time. They're coming back, hopefully. All this, let me tell you, we wanted to reach out and do something right because there's too many people with gas prices going crazy and everybody blaming everybody else. We really wanted to do something good for you guys in Oregon because, come on, everybody loves Oregon. Uh, but we love Oregon. So here's this why we're coming out to you like this. All right, let's move along here. So in addition, one of the downloads that we're going to have for you, which by the way, on the tab uh, that should be on the right of your screen, there should be a tab there that's called downloads. And if you click that down arrow, you will get uh, in there. Uh, this poster, we have a, another poster, English and Spanish, along with the webinar slides, so that you can use these as training resources to train your folks with. The Espanol, Rick, got to yep. have the Espanol. Yep, we do, have those. Do you speak Spanish, Rick? I do not. I do not. Don't speak Spanish myself. I wish I did, though. Let me be it would be you. handy, I'm telling you. It would be handy. Um, so that's it on the heat illness part of this. Um, the next regulation that we wanted to talk about now this one as i mentioned does not require you having a written program however it will have some things that you as an employer will need to do to comply with this as well as providing yep. training for your employees this one goes into effect as i mentioned uh, on july 1st and uh, again we have all the training specific to oregon for this as well as yes. any other heat training that you will need anyway again this oh and i forgot to mention with the last standard and this standard as well if you happen to be in the field of agriculture where you provide housing for late your labor there's some additional requirements we didn't want it we're, we've got a lot of information here and we're trying to get through it but just know that if that fits you if you fit that description there's some additional requirements that you need to fulfill as well on both of these programs yeah and if you need help and you help want you questions give us a call yep all right, so this one applies to public and private sector employees whose employees are or will be exposed to wildfire smoke where the ambient air concentration for the particulate matter 2.5 is at or above 35 or the AQI of 101. So you can see a chart down here below which lists the uh you know the visibilities and, and the different aqis and and how they read that there so that's going to apply to pretty much everybody here again you've got exemptions and partially exempt so if you work in enclosed buildings where the air is filtered uh and the doors and windows and uh, are kept closed when it's and uh except necessary you know, to quickly and briefly open doors to exit or whatever, right. if you're in that kind of controlled environment, uh, enclosed vehicles. Mm -hmm. So um, you're driving around your delivery person or something like that. Yep. So if, if you're in the vehicle and again, it's filtered and, and what have you, uh, when the employer predetermines that the operations will be suspended to prevent employee exposure. So if you know already that when it gets to these levels, you're going to stop working for that period. We're closing the shop. Yes. Then you don't have to worry about putting in those measures. And then, of course, for employees that work at home. And then you've got some 
partially uh, partial exemptions. Again, the wildland uh, firefighting support activities such as campfire management, uh, emergency uh, operations, yeah. and then work activities involving intermittent exposure of less than 15 minutes. So there's some partial exemptions again if that if you fall into those categories. They've got some definitions here. You, you'll want to, I guess, pay particular attention to the groups that they list here as sensitive. So that's something that you got to consider, obviously, people with emphysema and asthma and some of these other conditions that they list here uh, might be a little more susceptible. So you can take a look at that, those definitions that they've put in their code. Right. Um, but now we're getting into things as an employer that you're going to need to do. So obviously, uh, these are things that you do when you know, I mean, when there's a fire going on nearby that you've got, you're smelling smoke in the air and what have you, you have to have a method here where you're monitoring the exposure of wildfire smoke when the employees are likely to be uh, exposed. So you have to check coverage or forecasted AQI, uh, department, uh, the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, the EPA, you can use those as sources, uh, check air quality advisories, uh, by the local and uh, mm -hmm. the Department of Environmental Quality, yep. and then also directly measuring uh, ambient concentrations, like you see in this photo of this gentleman here using a piece of equipment to, to monitor. And then uh, it says if the employer uh, determines and can demonstrate that none of the methods in this subsection of the standards are available to work in their location, that they can use this visibility index. So they've got an alternative, but one way or another, you gotta be doing an assessment to see- You gotta be able to see the assessment so you can see the fire the fire smoke. I mean, you've gotta do it. I love the tool that you can have and get a couple of your guys trained on that. You can throw it in the air. That way there's no guessing, especially if you got people with asthma, allergies, or any sort of lung <laughs> condition. Love the test reader, guys. Take a picture of it with your cell phone when you're doing that testing on it. That would be helpful. Yep. Um, again, you got to provide training for your folks here, yeah. uh, you know, and that this is both for management because they may have different responsibilities and your employees. Again, we have all of these for you. We've got the lessons and you can see a couple of the samples there in the picture. Yep. Uh, they're they're double-sided pages. These lessons are geared so they can be delivered in about 15 minutes to somebody, like a tailgate talk or something where they can go through bullet points, see what it is, gives you the information. There's pictures on there and if it needs to be graphic, there are some times action and pictures on there, but, but the reality is we've got this for you. And Rick, do I got yep. it in Spanish? Everything's in uh, Spanish. Uh, love it. Everything in the Espanol and English. So we and got it. We're 45 minutes in. So at this point, for expedience sake, I'm not going to read all the different types of things, but you can imagine the respirators yes. and, and different types of things that you're going to need to train your folks on. Uh, you need to have a way for two-way communication. So obviously, if you've got guys out of job sites, yes. maybe radios, phones, what yes. have you, could be verbal in a warehouse, but you've got to have a way. So and and teach your folks, you know, both so that the supervisors can can let the folks know what they need to do, but also so that the, the workers yep. can report back if anything changes, if people are sick or what's going on there. I agree with you. Got to have it, guys. Got to have it. Then exposure controls. So administrative controls, uh, implement engineering and administrative controls. So appropriate engineering controls may include or not limited to uh, temporarily relocating outdoor workers to available indoor areas, if that's a possibility. Uh, also, it says about relocating to another outdoor location or changing the, the work schedule. So, so that's one of the things you can do. Also, when things reach a certain level, you got to have the offer, the voluntary use of filtering devices, which yes. have to be provided by the employer. And you got to pay for them. You can't expect you guys to pay for them. Yep, you got to pay for them, and you got to make sure these are stores maintained properly and what have you. And then, uh, you know, if the levels get even beyond that, you, you may have to. It's no longer voluntary. You have to require that they wear these filtration things. And then, if it's really bad, you might even get to the point where they're actually having to use respirators. Right, right. And you have let's, to. Let's hope that doesn't get like that. And you have to have those systems. So that code, we kind of went through that one a little quicker. It's not as in depth and as complicated. We spent more time on the heat illness, um, but but we have everything that we that you need to do this. And again, Mike, just want to let you guys know, you know, at Got Safety with, with this 
offer that we have for you that we have all the resources. You're, you're going to like this special offer. We want to be able to do this for you. And uh, for the special offer, you just give us a call. We'll take care of you. So if you don't know what the offer is, let us know. This webinar we're going to put on YouTube. And so we're going to throw it out there. So we're not getting into the details of the special offer. But if you've registered for this, email, this webinar, we're going to attempt to contact you so we can give you the special offer. I promise you, we're going to make your life a whole lot easier, a lot, lot easier. So this will be great for us. What you're staring at that on the screen is our God Safety app. You can see that you can sign off on your training response, live, uh, your training stuff online, your safety lessons and tailgates, all the things that we talked about are there, and the documentation that you're going to have to have. We can put that on there too, so that you guys don't need any printed binders on the job site. That's just what that is. So there you go, just so you know what that is. Questions, comments, and concerns. What you got going on, Big Glenn? Yep, Glenn, hit us with the questions all while right. I get us off the. Uh... Stop the <laughs> here. I got some good stuff for you guys. Oh my gosh. First of all, right. does anybody say that they hate our guts? Uh, there's very little hate mail on here. What? I am happy about that, everybody. You'll have to try yeah. harder next time. Yeah, we'll try. Okay, uh, first of all, I, we got a lot of really good insight and commentary on the temperatures of Oregon because apparently last year was a doozy. There was a lot of record setting, and uh, someone said even in Portland, they had a day of 115. Oh, my gosh. You're not working at all that day. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. No wonder they came out with this code. Well, well let's let's hope you're not seeing a lot of days. I, I was thinking these might be uh, these high heat Hard days. Hard reach. They, right. I, I was thinking it might be like a snow day in no, California. No, no. This right? is not a snow shut day. Shut down the schools. Shut down work. Everyone gets to go play. Well, oh, it's, but it, it might be more common. Sure. Than, uh, in addition to that, someone else mentioned that uh, you do have in Eastern Oregon a high desert climate where there is uh, a more arid and high temperature environment. Well, you're going to like this because you'll be working 30, uh, 45 minutes <laughs> and breaking 10, 15 minutes. So. <laughs> Or the or other way around. Yeah, vice versa. That what it is. Yep. So you're probably screaming the same thing we're screaming when we saw this. So you guys aren't even going to work anymore. Right. <laughs> All right. So uh, I've got a question saying, can can we use a company rig with AC for a cool down area? And I'm assuming that's referring to some sort of uh, RPE or something like that. Listen, so when you say rig, I just want to give you a couple definitions what I'm thinking when you say rig. I'm talking like a uh, bobcat, not a bobcat, like a backhoe with an enclosed cab. <laughs> yes. okay, that's a no because you can't get very many people in there. That's the problem. Or so, even a work truck. So so Glenn is a good man. He's thinking you're talking about like a freaking Winnebago, fully AC, <laughs> locked and loaded. Yeah, if you've got a Winnebago to put out there and that's what your rig is, Go for it. But we know that's not what it's going to be. You can't use a pickup truck unless you're going to AC that thing all the Consulate, time. right. Yeah, it, it, you can't. Because when they're ready to go to break, we can't be waiting for 10 minutes for the thing to cool down. Yes. And let me tell you, that car's going to be hotter than blazes when your boys get in. They'll probably die in there than just sitting in the heat outside. No. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to say that I mean, one's not a good one. It's okay. been rejected. <laughs> Holy rejected. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah. Are the requirements uh, for Oregon OSHA and California similar? If one's uh, more strict, can you use one for the other one and get away with it? No, you can't. So let's suggest you have a company that's in two locations, California ah, and Oregon. Or you're doing work down in California. Now, the only thing I can say to you on that now is, is it's a good thing you know me now because I can write documentation for both companies and show you how to comply. Well, not but both companies, both states. Both states. Thank you, Rick. But you are certainly not going to use one state for the other. That is not the way this works. If you're if you're doing the work in Oregon, you're under OSHA, Oregon OSHA's jurisdiction and have to follow their guidelines. Yes. And same with California. But that's why we're going to be best friends. I can yes. feel this. You're going to love us because we're going to help you navigate this. Yep. This if you're same. working on both sides of the border, yes. you're going to need both programs All and right. follow different sets of rules depending on where you're working. What you got, Glenn? Okay. So I've got uh, somebody saying they work in a paper mill. Huh? And doing maintenance while machines are still running, and uh, the heat is 100% humidity and 120 degrees. Yeah, listen, so. that heat, oh, listen, unfortunately, you do not comply with this under the standard because of the, the bakery logic. Yes. The <laughs> bakery logic tells us that if you have indoors an area where it's artificially hot, not because of the sun, but because machines... We believe, as it stands now, from what we've been able to read, that you would not be, you would not fall into this because of it. But I am telling you this: I can't imagine you would that be you crazy 
not to do heat on this training. You'd yes. be crazy still not to call us and take advantage of our offer just to have all the training ready yes, to stuff. Train your employees, obviously provide yes. them with some breaks and water just because you don't have Listen, to by the regulation and, and I know that, doesn't mean you shouldn't. Right. And I know the people working in that place are probably acclimatized already because they'd be dead if they weren't working yes. in that kind of temperature. Holy cow. But I'm saying this. I you, hope you, you pay well. You <laughs> <laughs> so you you just gotta make sure that you're doing some training on that because if the person dies in there, they're not going to say they're going to be a general rule within the OSHA regulations that you didn't train for unsafe conditions. So yes. just know there will be a general code you can get it. Glenn, give it to us. Okay. Uh, so one of the charts or one of the tables uh, refers to heat index versus adjusted temperature or air temperature. Uh, what's the best way to measure that like in an indoor company? Uh, I, do you just measure the outside and guess that it's the well, same, or what's, what's that the deal? That, that's why this wasn't in the code. That's why they didn't bring this. This is why oh, right now Oregon's laying the outside heat yes. on and they're not dealing with the inside because of the difficulty. What I would look at on the inside is this. What's the temperature? Yes. And just go with that. And the humidity, what's the temperature and the humidity? Yes. Do, do I think it's you the should be doing 30 minutes of work, 30 minutes of break? Okay, that's insane. No. But what I am saying is this. I would make sure my guys have watered up and everything they need. Personally, for me, I try to take care of my team. Uh, I do things for them. Uh, I would supply Gatorade and Igloos or something if it gets over a certain temperature because you're really talking about making sure you have electrolytes and things that are retaining because a lot of these employees, man, they love the energy drinks, man. They are pounding energy drinks right and left, and they, they're not really getting that they are going to die without water. And uh, some of these people can't remember when they had a glass of water. It's been so many days. And right? the reality is anytime we get these new regulations, until we real till the rubber hits the road when OSHA starts citing people, it's we hard. see how they're implementing it is tough. Yeah, it is. Glenn, give it to us. Okay, I got a couple people that uh, are still wondering about having multiple policies that could be implemented in different uh, job sites for in, for in the heat illness program. No, different job sites. Uh, like choosing option A versus option no, B. No, right now we see nothing in the code that suggests that you can have two different. We have this that discussion. Di yeah, this job site can go that standard and this guy can go the other standard. We see nothing in the code that allows. It talks about your company has to choose a standard. Which is why I said that you, you, you're going to have to look. Are the majority of my guys doing light yeah. work versus yeah. the heavy work? And which one of these is going to work best for my company overall? Not everybody individually we're not making the rules guys we're just telling them about it and telling them how they're going to enforce them glenn the great yes uh, a couple of people are mentioning that washington is going to be implementing similar uh, code enforcements are we are we doing another similar training for washington we probably will we, be. we will be we're working on that it. one right now once we get the stuff and we know what they're how it's going to be we're going to develop another webinar and do that and if you want to be invited we we, we can do that because some of you guys may be doing business in washington too Okay, that's that's all I got for you today. Hey, thank you guys for coming out and taking a look at us and uh, letting us feed you this information. Slides, we're going to send the slides, Rick. We're, well, we're the post slides this. are available. If you haven't downloaded them already, go before you exit the webinar, go to the right, click down. On the, there's five downloads there. Yeah. Just the PDFs, download them straight to your computer. You'll get those now. Somehow you miss it. If you email me, I'm rick at gotsafety.com. I'll send those to you. And again, we'll be contacting you or you can contact us on that special offer. Right, well. right. On the special offer, please reach out to us. Let us know if you're looking for it. Uh, and uh, my name is Michael Crowley. And I'm Rick Roman. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, guys. If you liked this webinar, please visit our YouTube channel for access to our past webinars. Also, follow us on social media for OSHA updates, information on upcoming webinars, reminders on safety tips, techniques, and more. What are you waiting for? Like, follow, or subscribe today, and stay safe out there.